You are listening to the second part of the story. You can listen to the first part in the previous video or by following the link in the description under this video. Happy listening. But it turned out to be him. He entered through the flimsy wooden door separating their prison from the rest of the building, blocking the light from the lantern, but she knew it was him. Hello, Mandy. His voice was booming, but with the promise of pleasures that were yet to come. You are a bastard. She poured out her fear and hatred, but he remained indifferent to her words. Michael is in danger. She herself didn't know why she was saying this. Perhaps she appealed to Robert's friendship with Michael, or perhaps to what once united them. He came and crouched in front of her, running his fingers gently over her cheek. Michael is in trouble. His intonation was even and final. But you can be safe, Mandy. Promise that you will be with me and I will save you. Do you really have no pity or repentance? She howled, hoping to find a crack in his hard facade. He looked at her, not paying attention to her words and remaining adamant in his determination. It's not about me, Mandy. Well, not just me. It comes from the very top. By this time, she was overcome with emotion and began to cry in fear. I can save you, Mandy. I can. He was so close that she could see his face. His expression was one of hope but at the same time there was something else in it. He's not sure, she realized. Another man arrived, scratched and cruel in appearance. She won't budge, he said with a grin. No, came out of Mandy's mouth as the reality of the dangerous situation hit her. Robert, what have you done? I did what had to be done to protect the company. Michael turned out to be not as smart as he thought. The alien told Robert not to joke with him. Robert was worried. At that moment, Michael woke up. He assessed the situation and realized that he had to act. He managed to free himself and disarm the criminals. He picked up the phone and called 911. Almost immediately, he was contacted by mobile number, to which he sent data about their current location, and was also told to leave the phone on. He put the phone in a dark corner and threw several rat-eaten cardboard boxes over it to hide it, then went to free Mandy. She, in turn, looked at him with a mixture of relief and awe. She was released, just as they heard footsteps approaching. The first one arrived and managed to search all their things. After a long search in their house, he found a box of pills. He seemed pleased. As he was about to leave, he noticed a shine on the floor and found a flash drive. His smile widened as he realized he had found something important. He entered the building, but soon he noticed a strange silence and frowned. His intuition told him that something was not as it should be. He pulled out his weapon and entered carefully, but there was a scuffle, as a result of which First and Mandy were injured. Michael tried to help Mandy, although she knew it was too late. She told him about her true feelings and admitted that she loved him with all her heart. Her words shook Michael to the core. When law enforcement officers arrived, they found a tragic scene. An exhausted Michael quietly hummed an old song to Mandy, trying to grasp his last moments with his beloved. When the police finally arrived, they found the first one first, and the exhausted Michael sang to Mandy a half-forgotten ballad by Don McLean. Bruno Rossi was furious. How is it that the FBI and Interpol took over the investigation and took all the glory? While the city police started the initial investigation, they were the first and made all the arrests. Cool coffee splashed from the ceramic mug onto the wooden conference table when he slammed his palm down on it. State's attorney Kim Fox raised her hand to try to stop his tirade, but Rossi wasn't listening. In our police jurisdiction, there are two kidnapped victims who were tortured. Attempted murder committed last year in Chicago by the same people. He paused to take a breath. One woman is in the hospital, two criminals are wounded, one of them seriously, and the third is dead. He looked around the room. Not to mention the criminal case against an international pharmaceutical company. We have mountains of evidence, including Bates' testimony, and it looks like Robert Newman's lawyer is trying to make a deal. So how did we end up on the sidelines? Captain Rossi, the Cook County Commissioner and Prosecutor, Kim Fox, and the four assistant prosecutors present at the meeting had already heard it all, and as much as she wanted to hold the case, it had all the hallmarks of a federal and international investigation, 
and the Department of Justice had already told them that their horse is in the race, and even the White House has climbed onto the wagon. The Foreign Affairs Committee was informed and the Swiss ambassador was summoned for consultations. Rossi looked at the FDA and FCSC representatives with despair. This is a serious matter. More than they expected, and the consequences would be international, not to mention the reaction of consumers who were already skeptical of big pharmaceutical companies and what they saw as excess profits. Another scandal awaits them. I think Congress will soon be bombarded with requests to investigate all pharmaceutical companies again. Fox sighed bitterly, knowing that international pharmaceutical companies were experts at muddying the waters and hiding their real profits through multi-layered structures that often took a decade to uncover, while a legion of forensic auditors under Minid Political will until every the investigation does not fade or dissipate into thin air. Well... Mrs. Bates did it, Fox reflected. At least this is a positive thing. And it was her husband who killed that kidnapper. What was his name? Husband or kidnapper? The kidnapper, Detective Rossi, I know the husband's name, Jerome Wilson. Almost completely unknown, except for crimes committed earlier. These cases have been sealed, but we are waiting for your office to petition the court to have them removed. He felt sad. The case that became decisive in his career slips out of his hands. Everyone except the feds was sympathetic to his bitterness, but this changed little, and the conversation already turned to discussing the Swiss side of the investigation. More than 15 people from Biovest were detained in Switzerland or France, said a representative of the Chicago office of the FBI SEC, Scientific Applications International Corporation. The case is moving quickly and law enforcement agencies in Europe and here are eager to bring cases to court as quickly as possible. Justice delayed is justice denied, Fox nodded. Yeah, and if you screw up, you screw up, Rossi muttered. Regardless of who screwed up, screwed up, Michael thought at the same time, drinking coffee in the hospital cafeteria with Darius. I ruined my marriage and myself, and worst of all, I can't even remember it. It's already visiting time, Darius frowned. Why are you still here, boy? He nodded his head towards the elevators leading to the chambers above. I'm not sure I can, Michael sighed. Every time I see Mandy, I remember her words, even if I don't remember what I did. I don't know what to do with her. I keep trying to discuss this, but she doesn't want to. His eyes became misty. She says it doesn't matter. But it does. You think about it too much. No, that's not true. Every time I see Mandy, I feel like a traitor. So you're hiding? This is not the Mikael I know. Darius tried to pour some positivity into him that would unbalance him. But for the first time, he admitted that nothing was working for him. Because Michael was not in a good mood. Everything was much worse. It seemed to him that three different people lived in one body. One is the old Michael, smart, strong, and capable. He remembered how his family, friends, and colleagues looked up to him and hung on his every word, words that are now difficult for him to choose on the fly. Then they came easily and immediately. Now he had to stop and think about what he wanted to say. That Michael seemed to him like a faded photograph, a ghost lurking in the corners and on the stairs of his mind, and sometimes looking at him with pity from the mirrors. The second Michael was a stranger. No, not a stranger. Someone or something malignant and hidden, like a killer or a tumor. He was the man who demanded a divorce and hurt Mandy to the point where she had nothing left and ended up in Robert's arms. He couldn't find Michael, but he knew he was somewhere nearby. Although it was like looking at a sealed vault, unable to enter, and knowing that there was a secret hidden there that he needed to uncover. The third Michael was slow and clumsy, with none of the grace or charisma of the first, he thinks of himself as the reheated leftovers of a delicious meal. The only part of the new man he is now that doesn't sadden him is the ability to commit the violence he did. He smiled grimly, reminding himself that it had to be done. It's like putting a mad dog to sleep. He stood up wearily. See you later, Darius. Maybe we can go for a run. They agreed to call each other, and he went to Mandy. She sat cross-legged in bed, wearing her pajamas, 
surrounded by printed statements, affidavits, and legal documents waiting for her to review and sign. She had lost weight, and her eyes looked sunken, but he thought she looked good compared to a couple of weeks ago. Medically, she is recovering, having lost part of her small intestine and spleen, which were perforated by two bullets, and subsequently had to be removed. She still doesn't feel well, and the drainage tube goes into a small bag attached to her thigh. She jokingly told him that she would never be able to wear a bikini again due to the bullet wounds and surgical scars on her body. But in truth, she had never worn one before. The fact that she is recovering is also evidenced by the fact that she was already bored with her stay in the hospital, and she began to complain about the food and the quality of the mattress on the bed. When he came in, she was on the phone with Jason, who came and stayed as long as he could, and then reluctantly left, returning to his job. He spent a lot of time with Michael, too. On his last evening, they went out to dinner and talked until late into the night. They drank brandy, and Michael quickly became sad and confessed much of what had happened between him and his mother. The conversation was difficult. Even adult children want to believe that their parents' marriage is infallible and sacred, but he was understanding of this. You're not helping yourself, Dad. If Mom says to move on, then why can't you? He reached across the table and grabbed Michael's hand. Time is running out, Dad. If you stand still and wait for inspiration, you will only widen the gap between you. I can even see it. Mikhail sat awkwardly wondering when his son had become a man and cursing his lost memories and lost time while Jason tried again. In flight school, they teach that no matter what is going on around you, if you are in the pilot's seat, your task is to control the plane, not lose orientation, and communicate. He looked at Michael with a hard but honest look. In other words, don't become inactive, Dad. Back in reality, Michael was confronted by a rapidly recovering Mandy and was forced to stop and ask himself why he was having such a hard time rebuilding the relationship. Mandy noticed his sudden withdrawal and the way his lips pursed and lost her smile for a moment, but then forced it back. She understood him better than he did, but she couldn't just tell him about the problem because he might not accept it. He might consider it nothing more than sophistry, or even resent her for spoon-feeding him on an intellectual level. In her opinion, the problem is that he found out about her cheating with Robert, and this is reality. The fact that he served her with divorce papers and was either cheating with another woman or was planning to do so was just a theoretical exercise for Michael, separated from his emotional self because he couldn't remember it, which means it was not reality. It's the same as hearing that something bad happened to a stranger. She wondered if he could love her again without first learning to love and forgive himself. He, in turn, accepted her, confused by the duality he felt. He wanted to hug her and kiss her on the lips, and at the same time he wanted to attack her for going with Robert, which became even worse when they found out that it was he who ordered the assassination attempt, and as if that wasn't enough, he doubted his ability to please her. His perceived inferiority forced him to struggle with his masculinity. He wondered for the thousandth time what had caused him to want to divorce her. Of course, there is no woman declaring that she loves him or he loves her, or that they made promises to each other, made plans, built a life together. Nothing. If it existed, it disappeared like morning fog, scorched by the sun. Both pushed their thoughts aside to focus on the present. They were surrounded on all sides by lawyers. The testimony had to be completed. Lawsuits against BioVest and Robert for personal injury claims. Meetings with Interpol and the FBI. Meetings with the FDA and EMA, the European Regulatory Body for Medicine and Pharmaceuticals. In addition, there have been ongoing requests from industry publications as well as international oncology associations asking for comment and sometimes clarification on previous comments. Professors and department heads who helped perpetrate the fraud for financial gain were backed into a corner. Some of them began to fight, but even they were quickly overwhelmed by the volume of evidence against them. Reputations were destroyed, jobs were lost, and those involved were not only removed from their positions, but also stripped of their medical licenses. The mainstream media gave Michael and Mandy their 15 minutes of fame, turning them into the heroes of an expose that was followed by a social media storm 
often directed at them. Of course, in BioVest, there are enough people viciously attacking them, claiming that they are either wrong, have personal motives, or for nefarious reasons want to shut down the company and all the good it has achieved. For Michael, it was overwhelming, and the situation spiraled out of control, made worse by the fact that he had stopped taking an SSRI and his bipolar condition had worsened, making him paranoid. It first emerged on the way home from hospital after a tough day of testimony, followed by Zoom and Teams meetings with European lawmakers, when he noticed a car following him. He pulled out of Lakeshore, and the car followed him. He made several random turns until the car disappeared. The next evening, there was another car, and it followed him almost to the house. He called Detective Rossi, who stopped by to see him. A patrol car was posted on his street for the next few days, and Rossi personally followed him, but nothing happened. And as soon as the police protection ended, they began to persecute him again. Mandy was concerned about his behavior and eventually met with Rossi and Karina Anderson. They agreed that no one was keeping an eye on Michael and that he was most likely having a nervous breakdown. After much thought and careful intervention, Karina convinced Michael to go to a psychiatric clinic. Later, when questioned, he honestly admitted that he suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, which leads to anxiety, which in turn leads to a feeling of persecution, leading to his paranoia. All this was caused not only by the night they were kidnapped, tortured, and nearly killed, but also by his previous brush with death and unexpected resurrection. Karina Anderson said that, his psychic chickens have come back to roost. The only thing that surprised her was how long they had been gone. His stay in the hospital had a number of benefits, not the least of which was that he was protected from the firestorm he and Mandy had started. He spoke to her almost daily even when she flew to Europe to testify. He himself testified live from his hospital via a communication channel Teams meeting. When she returned, she visited him as often as she could, but again bounced around the courts, testifying in criminal and civil cases. She was busy struggling with the world while he thought he was doing nothing but introspection. But he needed it and wanted that passive existence while his brain tried to catch up with his body. A local psychiatrist, in consultation with Karina Anderson, decided that part of Michael's problem was that he had not had time to mourn his previous life then his new life was baptized in the fire of violence. As if that weren't enough, it turns out that even his self-perception of his previous life was wrong and he is swimming in dark waters. Yes, Michael. Finally. Karina Anderson worked with him on recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder. Say it again. I am who I am. I am what I am. Michael repeated his personal mantra. I forgive myself for what I did, consciously or unconsciously. A tear ran down his cheek. I deserve a happy life. I will strive for a happy life. Karina looked at him for a long time. Since his awakening, she had interacted with enough people to understand who he had been before, but who he was now was no less interesting and attractive. Despite his shortcomings, when viewed from the outside, Michael is quite an attractive person, she thought. He learned to walk, although raising his foot slightly higher than usual, which was almost imperceptible. But thanks to this, his lazy leg did not drag. He wore invisible hearing aids and his speech was virtually clear, except when he became agitated and began to stutter adorably. Moreover, when he stopped to think about important issues, there was a sincerity in his speech that everyone found charming. He was well-read and knowledgeable in many matters and although she understood that he was no longer the outstanding person he had been before, he was still not a klutz, and she considered him at least above average in intelligence, and his critical thinking, although somewhat ponderous, it was invariably true. It's time! She smiled and pushed him out of the nest. Mandy took a sip of her cappuccino. Her flight will soon be announced to start a new life. She leaves Chicago for good and goes to the Bahamas to spend some time with Jason and Vera, Jason's other half who worked as a marine biologist on the island. Mandy had spent the last week putting the details of her or their old life in order. The house was sold with all its furnishings. She and Michael opened new accounts in their own names. 
Both accounts contained almost $17 million. This made them wealthy, but not rich. In her understanding, rich is a completely different thing. But wealthy enough to enjoy all the benefits of life and never work unless they themselves want to. And she may want to. She was approached by the FDA for a position overseeing the use of old and new drugs, but she, at least for now, declined. It's been almost 26 months since Michael was shot, two months since the last trial ended. She smiled with satisfaction, remembering the judicial bloodbath that followed. Robert received a life sentence for his participation in the attempted murder of Michael and another 50 years in total for his participation in their kidnapping and torture. Number two, as she called him, was Kenneth Wilson. It turned out that number one and number two were cousins. In any case, he received two life sentences without parole and seemed to be a poor fit in the prison environment, given that they had already tried to stab him to death twice. From the top management of the company, BioVest 4 were extradited and tried in the United States, and two of them received life sentences without parole and the remaining two received 25 years. The remaining executive directors, 11 in total, were tried in Europe and have not yet been sentenced, but they will not be lenient. She and Michael filed a joint lawsuit against Robert and company BioVest, receiving compensation from Robert of just over $6 million. He was left with almost nothing, but it didn't matter. $45 million were paid out in the lawsuit against BioVest. Thirty-five for Michael and 10 for her. They sued for the equivalent of $100 million, but European courts typically awarded less than what a U.S. jury would have awarded. The second monetary blow for BioVest was the imposition of a fine of 500 million euros by the European Medical and Pharmaceutical Authority, EMA, due to which BioVest was shaken because of the expenses for hexalidomine whose registration applications were withdrawn around the world, sharks were also added. Their lawyers received 20% of the fine amounting to as much as $2 million. She and Michael opened an account in which $7 million was intended for Jason, and they decided to split the rest. Initially, she only wanted to get what was due to her. But Michael not only insisted, but also became unapologetic until she gracefully relented. They agreed to donate the proceeds from the sale of the house, to the University of Chicago School of Medicine and another 500,000 to the Chicago Veterinary Association as a sign of respect for Darius and the help he provided to Michael outside of work. Michael also transferred ownership of his SUV to Darius, much to the latter's embarrassment. Unfortunately, all of the travel, litigation, lawsuits, and associated stress resulted in the relationship between Michael and Mandy being best described as half asleep, half distant. She tried to interest Michael in moving to Fort Lauderdale and living on the canals. He said he would love to, but not now. He was engaged in some personal quest that both excluded her and forced him to carry out a single-minded and secret mission. She had tried numerous times to mend her relationship with him, but the last five months didn't seem to be doing her any good. Their shared ordeal and her subsequent recovery initially brought them closer together, but the ensuing months drove them further apart. Unfortunately, she had to admit that their relationship had become unclear and fragile, leaving her unsure of how to repair it. Karina Anderson advised her to step aside. Let him come to you himself, she advised. Just before she left, she called Michael. Bye, Mike. I love you. Her voice suddenly broke as she was suddenly overcome with emotion. She thought that her tears had dried up and she had poured out all her high emotions, but obviously not all. I... I love you too, Mandy, but I have to do something first. There was concern and even fear in his voice. Not her. Please, Michael, she thought. I can't lose you again. You've already managed to get him back twice. There won't be a third time said the irrational part of her brain. Michael thought that the cold autumn temperature perfectly reflected the temperature of his heart and soul. His whole life seemed cold and gray, and images of Mandy in the Bahamas replayed in his head with longing. He envied her unlimited freedom, sun, sea, and escape from the hard and fast pace of life in Chicago. 
but he was not ready for freedom. Not yet. He started calling everyone until he received the phone number of his former personal assistant. What do you need, Michael? She didn't seem particularly fond of him. I need your help, please, Georgia. I would prefer it if you just forgot my number. She was about to hang up when he addressed her again. Sorry to intrude, Georgia. Please give me five minutes. I promise never to call you again. It was time to get down to business, but he was having a hard time starting a conversation. Um, you know, before I was shot and everything that followed, e e yes, I, have I met anyone? There was a long silence. You know, before I got shot and everything, what, Michael, do you want to be reunited with your toy? Patricia Grant, known to her friends and colleagues as Trish, noticed her reflection in the glass. At 35 years old, she looked great in a business suit with a short skirt and high heels that gave grace to her long and slender legs. Her position as senior marketing manager at Boston Scientific meant that she happily left BioVest's marketing department for a company that specialized in cardiology and had a long and successful track record in ICD. The International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. She allowed herself a small, pleased smile at how lucky she had escaped this trouble. But now it was time to find out if the company was still there. BioVest and all this unpleasant baggage is in the rearview mirror, or there is still an anchor connecting her to her past life. She walked into the Gaslight Coffee Shop on Milwaukee Avenue and immediately noticed Michael. Surprisingly, her heart skipped several beats. He was thinner than before, and the passage of time had added some gray to his hair, giving him a thick, attractive head of salt and pepper hair. She noticed a dent on the side of his forehead from the bullet that nearly killed him, the same bullet that undoubtedly ruined their relationship. Or was it an affair? But this word has so many negative connotations. Hi, Michael. She stood in front of him, and he raised his head in fear. You, you are Trish, he exclaimed, standing up to greet her. Tears nearly came to her eyes when she realized that he barely recognized her. To Michael, she seemed vaguely familiar. He vaguely remembered meeting her once, but nothing more. Please sit down. He gestured to the chair opposite him. They looked at each other in silence for some time. She ordered coffee and then put her thoughts in order. Things weren't going the way she expected, or she was just fooling herself, and things weren't going the way she'd hoped. I came to visit you, you know, she held his gaze. When no one is around. An unexpected tear ran down her face. You don't remember me, do you? I'm sorry, he muttered. I've lost so much. And now you've lost me, she thought, and shrank slightly inside. Seeing Michael in the flesh, in good health, she remembered everything he meant to her and laughed at the fragility of a relationship she had been indulging in for the past two years. They drank coffee and slowly, hesitantly, talked more and more about their relationship. It all started when they were together at a company promotional event in New York. A few months later, they were together again in Orlando. She had just divorced her husband and felt fragile. He was surprised that a younger woman was interested in him. While the managers were on a trip to an event in Switzerland, they struck a deal and began a hot and steamy relationship after that. He couldn't believe how wild she was in bed. She, in turn, was glad that he was focused on pleasing her. They hadn't discussed her previous relationships or his marriage except in passing, but they had learned enough. There was too much of a man in her husband. He spent more time with his friends, hunting, fishing, canoeing, and playing sports. Until they became strangers, only occasionally living in the same house. Michael said that because of the work schedule in his marriage, he and Mandy passed each other like ships in the night. Moreover, he is bored even when they are together, which became even worse when their son left home. He also admitted that Mandy is too conservative in her approach to life in general, but especially in the bedroom. They talked a little more, but the conversation was one-sided. Trish was trying to find at least some remnants of connection with Michael, and he was searching his brain for at least some memories of the time when they were together. Both found nothing. There's nothing left for us, is there? Trish asked, taking a sip of her second cup of coffee. 
No, I'm really sorry. He frowned, feeling guilty and at the same time relieved. I just don't remember anything. It feels like all this happened to someone else. Okay, it's all over now, she admitted to herself. The end of the novel. But it was a great novel, full of excitement and promise. Now all she has left is a heart full of ashes from a long extinguished fire, but at least it's some kind of closure. They hugged awkwardly, she left, and he finally felt that his unknown past was over. Michael has arrived! Mandy danced! She thought about making a quick call to Karina, whom she and Michael now considered a personal friend, to confirm the strategy they had developed, but that call was probably unnecessary. The strategy was developed, and all that remained was to begin implementing it. By the time Michael flew to Grand Bahamas and then took a second flight to Georgetown, she had already spent nine days in the Bahamas. Mandy had booked a room for him at the Hideaways Hotel in Palm Bay, but was out of range herself. The SMS said that she had left with Vera on a sea expedition and did not know when she would return, but perhaps they would stay there for the night or a little longer. The text message said that she would leave him alone for a while, but recommended restaurants and a few drinking establishments that he could try. When he tried to call to clarify, he received the following answer. The subscriber you dialed is currently unavailable. There have been no messages from him. The chalet was five stars, but he was surprised to see no sign of Mandy in the room. He asked at the reception, but the room was only booked in his name. Strange, he thought, but perhaps she lives with Vera. He arrived with a tiny carry-on suitcase with almost nothing in it, so he went shopping the first day and came back with khakis, clam digger shorts, swim trunks, shirts, t-shirts, canvas sneakers, leather loafers, underwear, and everything else, whatever I could think of, as well as an expensive pair of retro Ray-Bans. That first night, he went to the Flagler room for a few cocktails and then went to the Exuma Yacht Club for some excellent fried fish and chips. He stayed at the bar until 10, but soon after that, his own condition forced him to return home. The next day, there was still no sign of Mandy. He spent the morning on the beach, getting in and out of the water whenever he felt like it. At the resort, he met several tourists, mostly family groups, but there were also newlyweds and even a few elderly singles. Young tourists were rare as they clearly preferred or could afford other or less expensive accommodation. The evening began with sundowners and pre-dinner drinks at Doc's Outdoor Bar. He recognized several of the tourists he had met earlier and was invited to join the small group that soon grew into a large one. They all ended up at Eddie's Edgewater Restaurant. He made friends, had fun, and left early. On the third day of his stay on the island, he managed to catch Jason between flights who confirmed that Mom was on the ocean shore with Vera and they would return when they flew back. So he spent another day with his new friends and had another evening of carefree fun. On the fourth day, he spent the entire afternoon and early evening with his new company. They then returned to Doc's bar. He was recognized by one of the gang members, who turned out to be a doctor. Are you the same Michael Bates who exposed BioVest? Michael sheepishly agreed. They patted him on the back. Well done, well done. Suddenly someone appeared behind him, he turned around and saw her. She was wearing a short sundress and sandals. The skin was tanned. Her hair was styled in a new short style and highlighted with highlights, making her look young and vibrant. Before he could say anything, she held out her hand and he stupidly shook it. Hello, I'm Manda. She looked at him intently. He looked into her eyes and understood the hidden message. I'm Michael. He held her hand for a few more seconds. My friends call me Mike. Would you like to treat me, Mike? They sipped rum cocktails while he tried to figure out what she was up to. I couldn't understand, but every time he started talking about them, she cut him off and asked harmless and ordinary questions. How long has he been on the island? How does he spend his time? How are the restaurants, food, drinks, etc.? She told him about her adventures on the water, hunting for young sea devils to count their numbers. They drank, she looked at the time, apologized that she had another meeting, and disappeared.
he returned to his chalet with a small dinner to go. I called her, but again there was no connection, and went to bed somewhat shocked. The next day passed in fruitless searches. Neither Jason nor she answered their calls. After lunch he slept, and in the early evening he went outside. I went to dock, but she didn't appear there. I checked known places, nothing. He ended up eating a burger, drinking a beer and heading back. He was passing the Flagler room when she came out. Mike, she called. Mandy, he replied. No, Manda, she corrected him. Join me and my friends for a drink. He noticed her group of about eight people, men and women. Some are local, others are visitors. He felt a little offended for a moment and considered refusing, but decided to join in to try to understand what game she was playing. The conversation was about local events until it turned to him. What are you doing in the Bahamas, Mike? He briefly wondered if this was some kind of trap, but all he saw were open faces all around. I've been in a difficult situation for quite some time now, he shrugged, realizing how much he was drifting with the flow of events happening around him. Then a friend suggested we go to the Bahamas to unwind, and here I am. They nodded to him as a sign of understanding, smiled and offered options for activities and excursions that might interest him. Soon, he felt the first signs of blackout. So he wished them good night and hastily retired to his home. The next day at breakfast, he wondered what Mandy, or rather Manda, was up to. She was obviously trying to recreate herself, but she treated him like he was almost a stranger and seemed to want him to treat her the same. He wondered how he would fit into her new life and whether he would fit in at all. But then why did she invite him to her place? Unless she changed her mind during the time that elapsed from the moment of her arrival until his appearance. Instead of agonizing over the issue, he decided to enroll in a Padi diving course offered at the resort. He always wanted to try it, but never found the time. Padi means, put another dollar in, laughed their young instructor, handing out insurance forms. And it's not as bad as its opposite, Nawi, the National Association of Underwater Instructors, he laughed again, which means, not another underwater idiot. He then introduced them to the equipment, where the fins were called fins. The air cylinder is called the immersion cylinder, and the part in the mouth that supplies air is called the mouthpiece. Inflatable vest over wetsuit, BCD or buoyancy control device, etc. A little later, they had to learn dive tables and receive their first advice. You will work in pairs. This means that you will always be next to your friend. Secondly, we will plan the dive and dive according to plan. No exceptions. The last task of the day was a 10-minute dive in the resort's deep pool. Then they were sent to study the instructions and were promised to conduct a test the next day and then the first underwater exercise. He headed to the bar for a cold beer when he saw Manda sucking something like a mimosa with several women from the resort. He smiled, waved, and walked up to the counter to order a Calic beer, then joined the women who waved at him. What are you doing, Mike? asked a tall, plump blonde. She was usually the leader of the group. He was wearing Ray-Bans and was sure his eyes weren't visible. As he gave Manda an appraising look, she had a neutral pose that didn't give anything away. Scuba diving lessons. He smiled and noticed a slight surge of interest. This will keep me busy for the next week or so. Two can play this game, he thought. There was a general conversation on the subject, and then he turned to Sandy, who was moving chips on the backgammon board on the bar counter. Hey, Sandy, I see a backgammon board. Do you play by yourself? Yes, I am, mister... And if you're thinking of challenging me, you better be a good player because I know how to kick ass. And I definitely dominate the field. She looked around for support from her sisters. Then let's play for money, he laughed. A dollar for a point? To those watching the game, a dollar a point didn't sound like much. But if you lost a game without removing a single chip from the board in a game that was raised to the limit, the loss would be equal to 2,800 and... $80. Unlikely, but this is the worst possible loss, 
so the bet is not such a small thing. They sat down to play. Most of the women, including Mandy, remained to watch. They played out the color. He got the white ones, she got the red ones, and she won the throw. Started with 6-4 and earned a point. She did not hesitate, but with the air of an expert began to place the chips. His first throw was a double four, and he ran towards the house. They rolled the dice and moved the pieces quickly, making loud clicking noises on the wooden board that made the spectators dizzy as they tried to follow the game. After some time, they both found themselves in their house and emptied the board. She beat him narrowly, receiving two dollars and a three-game drawing. In the second game, he doubled the bet before they even started the game, and then she doubled it too, so the game was already at four dollars a point. His dice rolls were blurry and unsuccessful, so that the two furthest chips stuck against her exit, but he slowly covered his home with chips and waited for her to leave a chip expo said, which eventually happened after throwing a six-one combination. Sixes, he announced, and threw out a double six, discarding the interfering chip. He doubled the bet again, and without thinking, she agreed. Sandy went from winning to being stuck and unable to play until he opened the field for her so she could get back on board. He crushed her, clearing his board so that she didn't get a single chip. That came out to $15 multiplied by 3 and multiplied by 8, which equaled $360. In the third and final game, he quickly won again, adding another $48 to the total. They shook hands and he lingered for a moment. In lieu of the cash you owe me, I'll consider it a deal if you can convince Mandy to go on a date with me tonight, he grinned. Sandy turned around. What do you say, girl? Are you ready to throw yourself on a grenade to save me from this sly guy? I will do it. Manda looked around the crowd with the selfless look of Sister Teresa. I'll save you from this shark. The sisters smiled approvingly, and Michael and Manda agreed to meet at the Vibe restaurant in Exuma at seven o'clock in the evening. Thank you for coming. He led her to the table. They ordered chilled Chardonnay with a pleasant sourness in anticipation of a seafood dinner. So what are we going to talk about? She smiled across the table. He thought for a moment as they settled in. Well, we're on an island, so let's see. Okay, I came up with an idea. If you were stuck on a desert island, what three things would you want to have with you? She waited for the wine to be poured and took a long sip. I see you immediately confused me, she laughed. Then she tilted her head to the left. Hmm, let me think about it. Her eyes sparkled with mischief. The first thing I would like is a man. In my opinion, you are already cheating, he laughed. Secondly, she continued, not paying attention to his remark, a solar radio so that we can listen to music and dance together. He raised his eyebrows. And the last thing is a container with French champagne, lying at a depth of four and a half meters underwater, so that every day we can dive and get a bottle. Very romantic, he agreed. What about food? Well, this is a job for a man, she laughed. Like everything else, they toasted each other and drank more. Okay, it's my turn. She looked him up and down. Since we are on an island, if you wrote a message and put it in a bottle to throw it into the sea, what would it say? Hmm, besides the obvious. Help? He grinned. Yes, naturally. She gave him no mercy. As a joke or seriously? It's up to you. Well, seriously, I would write, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do. The only thing that matters is finding someone to love. This, this is unexpected. Her eyes clouded, but she held his gaze. The waiter then came over and they placed their orders. The rest of the evening went well, and before they even knew it, it was almost ten. He paid and they headed towards the exit. She kissed him on the cheek before getting into the taxi, and he walked home. He spent the next day taking a scuba diving course. The first dive was scheduled for late evening. The five trainees and their mentor climbed off the side of the rubber boat and dived 14 meters, adjusting their buoyancy by pumping air into their BCDs as they had been taught, until they were left floating a couple of meters above the coral reef. Tropical fish swam past them, and a large potato perch swam up to them, 
curious and clearly accustomed to being fed by other underwater swimmers. When the time came, they surfaced as a group and stopped for ten minutes at a depth of four and a half meters to safely decompress. Then we found ourselves in a boat and drinking bottled water to prevent dehydration. He felt tired and lethargic, so after packing all his gear and taking off his wetsuit, he took a cold shower and passed out on his bed. The next morning they had an early dive at six o'clock and a second dive at noon, and they all returned to the resort tired. He woke up from the phone ringing. It was Manda. Good evening, Mike. Would you like to have dinner with me? I'll treat you. I'd love to, but I'll be bad company today. I had two dives that exhausted me. She hesitated for a minute, then, remembering that she had noticed how lonely vultures. At the resort they started circling around Michael, I decided not to risk it. Let's have dinner early and I'll put you to bed early. So, Manda, what is this promise to put me to bed early? He grinned at her as she twirled the stem of her Bahama Mama cocktail glass in her hands. Or was it just for the sake of a nice word? Well, who is teasing whom? She answered. He looked at her and noticed how glowing her skin was from the after-sun lotion. Her short hair was voluminous, and her eyes were large and clear. Makeup is minimal, with the exception of mascara and soft copper eyeshadow, which gives her eyes extra mystery and her lips a slight blush. The sun, sea, and air added life to her, and she animatedly talked about new experiences, bringing an atmosphere of excitement and interest. The last project she was involved in involved late hatching of green turtles on Little Abaco, she told him about how exciting it was to watch the hatching and how the volunteers made sure the little turtles made it to the water. He, in turn, talked about the variety of reef fish he saw on three dives, including butterfly fish, flute fish, moon fish, angel fish, and the scary-looking but peaceful urchin fish. She showed him photos and videos taken on her phone. He showed her videos from his underwater GoPro camera downloaded to his phone. At the end, when he thanked her for the evening, she couldn't wait any longer and gave him a long, slow kiss. They parted and she ran to a waiting taxi. On the tenth day of his stay on the island, they met after a separate dinner at the open-air bar, Dock, and found themselves at the water's edge on a moonlit beach with their drinks. They stopped to look at the splash in the waiter and somehow she ended up in his arms. He kissed her deeply. Take me, Mike. She breathed it into his mouth. She wore a fitted white dress with a mid thigh hem, trimmed with dark blue braid. She had taken off her shoes earlier and was barefoot. You are beautiful, he whispered. Every part of you. She was relieved that her scars didn't put him off and she pared. They made love. Oh, God, Mike, I need this so much. After pulling on their clothes, they returned to docks and ordered more rum cocktails. They were as if chained to each other. He held her tightly, afraid that if he didn't hold her, she would slip out. And she, in turn, couldn't get enough of the way his body pressed against hers. I must possess you again. He murmured in her ear, and goosebumps ran down her arms and thighs, and she bit her tongue to keep from moaning in response. He threw the money on the bar and almost ran and dragged her to the taxi. At home, they made love again. I needed you. I needed you too. And for a very long time, his tears dripped onto her forehead and hers ran down her face until he lowered himself and kissed them away. Forgive me for the hell I put you through. I guess I was a fool. No, I realized that I didn't do much to remain attractive to you. Work, raising Jason, the usual everyday tedium, she sobbed, and he kissed away another batch of tears. That's why I had to reinvent myself to please you. She looked into his eyes, and I hoped that I would become the one you liked. He nodded in understanding, but his own fears still hung between them. I know I'm not the man you married, Manda. I feel like I'm just a shadow of who I was. You are not a shadow, my dear. She cupped his face with her hands and began to kiss him again and again. You are real, strong and smart, and I love you more than I can express. I love you, Manda. Hot tears fell on her face. You saved my life twice. And you saved me, so I think we saved each other. 
She smiled through her tears. Can we move on, together? I want to be your wife, your girlfriend, your lover. She looked fierce and determined, and her heart was open to him. I will say that we are rich enough to devote the rest of our lives to making each other happy. He began to lose consciousness, and his eyes closed. The last thing he remembered was, the rest of our lives are good. The next day they began planning their next adventure. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.